Jesus Christ. He washed my sins away. Jesus washed, he washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. Yeah. Oh, happy day. He taught me, he taught me how yeah. to walk, to walk, by every Kwa masita ndita Florence, mbona mwithiani. Ndiye ndako thata, neenda kuina, wethe uthato ningeni na uangoni. Kazi jasuwa, ni wadhimo, ya, ya, ni wadhimo. Ni kuitu kwa nedha wanjeshi la ukofu, na kuitu kwa nedha wanjeshi la ukofu ni makuina. 
Lakini ngai ya ndeve siya, o ino akwa tie vina. Kiba nga suwa ni kweda e, o ite kika ini ndi vina. Kibena ni mbeza, nguko ya kwendo ya ya na ya nyo kibu, nyo ni tenka umi mbeza, isupa u, ngeza ni iwe ni mudhanga u, kwa na wata kendu chako nguwe guamu yo. Tusikuma tu unoni ya bae nove ya kibeti, ina mutezi didi nyongo ene, na siende edhesia. Nindu matungi ya mwea, kiasi wanga hii ya meke nesa. Angiasi ya, papu mbezi usi na umye, wanga hii ya ongelele vo. Nye mwamba ni salama, nye mwamba ni salama, nye mwamba ni salama. Mwamba ya, kibwa ya siya na siya kasika rena mungu kula si. Angibwa ya mbua, hivu ya nduweza kila mtu wako ato kaindo. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday worship on this, the fifth Sunday of Easter. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This online service is being brought to you by the High Wycombe Methodist Circuit, Marlow Methodist Church and Christ Church URC Marlow. And whoever you are and wherever you and whenever you're watching this, you are very welcome to join us in worship. In fact, everyone is especially welcome today as we explore our interconnectedness and reflect on one of the most beautiful aspects of our relationship with our Creator, that mysterious quality of relational love that allows us to surely and securely dwell in God. In fact, even more surely and securely than we dwell in the world or for the past year in our homes. And at the same time, we're going to explore how through some expansion of our hearts we allow and experience God dwelling in us and acting through us so that our works may become by infinite grace the plump ripe delicious nourishing and fulfilling wholesome fruit of God's Holy Spirit. Now the beauty 
and the power of this relational energy, this interplay of emotions, this interweaving of our physical and spiritual lives with one another and with God, this potential for communion that God has placed within us, within our nature and within all nature itself, the very nature of nature extending through the whole of creation is difficult to convey remotely through the medium of the internet and the limitations of our devices because it is so fundamental to our very being, so deeply and intrinsically experiential. It is the very defining essence of who I am and of who we are and of our creator when we hear the creator saying, I am. When Jesus described this concept to his disciples, as we will hear, he used the metaphor of a grapevine with its roots in God's good soil and its many interwoven branches and the rich and abundant fruit that it produces when it is properly tended and lovingly cared for. So let us start this morning at the very beginning with God, the creator, God, the good farmer and vine dresser who in the beginning makes order out of chaos, clears the land, lays out a field, plants the tender vines, provides the sun and the rain and eagerly waits for us to bud and grow, hoping against hope that the fruit we bear is sweet. And so, as our call to worship this morning, the song of the vineyard from Isaiah chapter 5. I will sing for my beloved a song of his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it up and cleared the stones and planted the finest vines. He built a watchtower in the middle and dug out a wine press as well. And he waited for the vineyard to yield good grapes. Thank you. 
John chapter 15 verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you said... I am the vine, you are the branches. We belong to you, Jesus. We are your branches. Thank you, amazing God, for all the beautiful things you have created. We love you and are filled with joy to be here with you today. Thank you that you have made us to be a part of your wonderful world. Let us become a true branch on the vine that is you, a branch that bears much fruit. Let us accept you in our lives in the way it pleases you to come into them. As truth to be spoken. As life to be lived. As light to be shared. As love to be followed. As joy to be given. As peace to be spread about. As sacrifice to be offered. Among our sisters and brothers and family. Among our friends and neighbours and all people. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to you, Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Dominion belongs to you, Lord. And you rule over the nations. Those who seek you shall praise the Lord. We come as those who seek, and we shall praise you, Lord. May, May our hearts live forever. forever. In, In Jesus' name. name. Amen. Hello, it's Linda from Marlow Methodist Church. Now, have you ever wondered what it's like to be a grape? Well, I have. When I look at a grape, I realise it took a long time to grow. First came the thick stem, then the little stems from which grew the leaves. And then, after a few years of that, finally, in midsummer, the first grapes, like little eyes, turn into juicy grapes all bunched together. In the story which Jesus told, he wanted us to be like the branches and grapes all joined together, with himself as the thick stem, keeping all alive and healthy. Maybe God is pleased with us when we do stay close to him, using our minds, bodies, hands, feet, to do good things, and also to use them to worship him as in the song we'll be singing. I will show you my grapevine as it is right now. We'll do some printing. This is what I had came up with and you'll be able to do the same or similar. Just take a look at this 30 year old vine. It's been growing up against our doorway for a long time. It has been pruned back, ready to have some new growth this year. But there's no sign just yet. Now these are the grapes, the kind of grapes that our vine grows. Dark purple and the leaf shapes are interesting, not just flat they curve and they also have three points to them, as you can see. 
and they need a lot of warmth and the more sun will ripen the grapes. Now I want you to be able to think about the grapevine more clearly by creating your very own picture. This is what I had came up with and you'll be able to do the same or similar. Right, to make your vine picture you will need some pictures of vines and leaves. You'll need scissors to cut them out. You'll need some brushes to paint them and the poster paints if you've got them or you could use watercolour and some twigs to help with the painting, some glitter, the paper and some plates or a palette and you will need your fingers as well. This is, this is for my twigs and the green for the leaves yellow. Now the grapes, I will mix two colours, blue and red. We're using a twig that's going to allow me to print with And I'm going to do a few little branches next to it. Here's the base of my vine. Now for the leaves, I'm going to cut them out. But I might not worry about the sharp edges. Just cut them out. And you can put as many as you like on there. Now for the you'll want to paint them. So let's have a go and see what happens if I print with it. See there it is like that, that's fine. Or I could turn it upside down, press down and then lift it off. And it creates a nice texture for leaf. And you could do the same with this one. And then finally, for the grapes, I, you can use your finger by mixing the two together. And they will be on a very, very thin twig. Vary the size and make sure that they hang down. Might be nice to have more than one bunch. Sometimes they have little curly bits, which are really fun to do. You might also want to add some glitter. You'll need to put a little bit of glue onto some of the grapes. Well, here's my picture finished. And I kept the original leaves and stuck them on the right way around too. God abiding in us, abiding in God. Water. An important symbol adopted by the early Christians when they were forced to meet in secret because of persecution is the fish or ichthus.
Fish live in water. A fish out of water cannot survive, just as a branch will not survive that is cut away from the vine. But at the same time, there is water in the fish, and fish cannot live unless they have water in them. Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. If anyone drinks the water I give them, they will never be thirsty again. But he also said, Whoever believes in me, streams of living water will flow out from within them. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a fount of water springing up to eternal life. Well, it's time to introduce you now to a song. It's a worship song involving your hands and feet. If you're standing up, you can dance as well. And here it goes. <laughs> Hands, hands, fingers, thumbs, we can live to praise him. Hands, hands, fingers, thumbs, we can live to praise. Hands, hands, fingers, thumbs, we can live to praise him. Jump from, jump back, yeah. We were meant to praise. Got some hands that we can praise. We've got a voice. To shout your praise, Jesus got some feet are made to dance. Let's use them now. We've got a chance. We've got some hands we can raise. We've got a voice to shout your praise, Jesus got some feet are made to dance. Let's use them now. We've got the chance, so oh, we were made to praise him. We were made to praise. We were made to praise him. We were made to praise. Our prayers of confession and forgiveness. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Let us pray. We thank you, gracious God, for Jesus Christ, the true vine, with his roots eternally grounded in you. We rejoice that by grace we have been grafted into him to be branches on a vine which bears the loveliest of all the fruits of earth. Yet we confess that all is not well with the way we live. Please forgive us the, for the occasions when we have been the ones to introduce disease into the vine, preferring its contamination to the vigour of health. Forgive us for neglecting to draw deeply on the sap of life, for our tendency to wander instead of growing on the framework you provide, for being content and sometimes even proud of a few sparse or undersized fruits for the apathy which lets us to go through some of the seasons without bearing any fruit. Have mercy on us. Please do not lose patience or sever us completely from the true vine. Rather, heal our diseases, discipline and train our wandering tendrils, prune our unfruitful branches and cut away our diseased ones. May we remain in Christ and he in us through all the changing seasons of life. Let us delight in bearing the fruits of love, which are our true purpose and joy. For your name's sake. Amen. Jesus said, If you reside in me, and my words reside in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Friends, we have asked for forgiveness and correction. It has been truly done for us. It is being done for us. And it will be done for us. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
God abiding in us, abiding in God. Air. In the creation story, God forms Adam from the dust of the ground and breathes the breath of life into his nostrils so that he becomes a living being. God's breath is the breath of life. But the Hebrew word for breath or air, ruah, also means spirit. So, Jesus tells Nicodemus that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. But then he says of the spirit, the wind blows where it wishes, you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So, we are born of the spirit that is around us, but scripture also tells us that the spirit who raises Jesus from the dead is also the same spirit living inside us. The reading is taken from 1 John chapter 4, starting to read at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, 
since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Amen. God abiding in us, abiding in God. Bread and wine. Jesus said, I am the bread of life and I have come down from heaven. For the true bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But Jesus does not only give us the bread to eat, as he did with the loaves and fishes. Jesus also becomes the bread. For on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul adds, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, earlier in the service, I read to you the first few verses of the Song of the Vineyard from Isaiah 5, a metaphor for God's troubled relationship with us his creatures. In this beautiful example of Old Testament Hebrew poetry, the prophet Isaiah depicts God as a vine keeper, so very carefully selecting the most perfect site on a fertile hill, carefully clearing the land, planting the finest vines, tending them, and then waiting for them to grow and yield good and sweet grapes. But if you read on further in that passage, you'll find that despite the huge amount of love the vine keeper has poured in, the fruit that the vines produce is sour. Sour grapes indeed. And Isaiah depicts a loving God as being almost against his wit's end. What more could I have done for my vineyard, God cries out, than I've already done for it? Why, when I expected sweet grapes... Did it bring forth sour fruit? And God, through Isaiah, goes on to basically argue, why not just 
tear the whole thing up, throw it all away, throw down the walls and start again. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are the plant of his delight. He looked for justice, but saw only bloodshed for righteousness, but heard a cry of distress. What are you doing to my creation, my world, my planet, my people with this ceaseless cruelty, this incessant violence, this incapacity to share resources for the good of all and this constant drumbeat of war and violence? God is asking that question, not just to the world, but to each one of us. How can it be that 10 whole acres of vineyard will yield but a single bathtub of good wine. Woe to those, the deceivers who call evil good and good evil, who turn darkness into light and light into darkness, who replace bitter with sweet and sweet with bitter. For they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And so they suffer and they suffered then and we suffer now. Our nations and our planet suffer all the while crying out against God as we continue, as Isaiah puts it, to use bribes to acquit the guilty and deprive the innocent of justice. Now, I wonder if you can see what is happening here, what is causing this to happen, what lies at the nub of the issue, the centre of the problem of our own individual troubles and suffering, whatever they may be the centre of the problem of our broken world and the huge injustices within it. How hard it is to penetrate the popular consciousness with any kind of a message of social justice, of equality and diversity, with any progressive issue. Making poverty history, the advancement of women, Black Lives Matter, rights for vulnerable people and those with mental illnesses, Vaccine distribution, good education, domestic violence, abuse of children, murder, abduction and crimes on our streets, combined with such basic economic inequality and lack of social mobility, and that just within Britain itself, let alone across the whole of the world. And the same thing all over again with the problem of caring for our environment, for climate change, for our wildlife, for the burning of pristine rainforests, for the burning of fossil fuels, for extinction and lack of biodiversity, for pollution and plastic in the oceans and all the many health issues and woes of our tiny planet. You see, I believe that the fundamental problem that underlies all of these other issues is the problem of separation. We have become separated from God and separated from God's ways. And because we are separated from God and no longer rooted in God, we have become fractured and separated from each other, from our sense of right and wrong, of good and evil and of the harm we are causing. If I'm not in relationship with you, if we are not in relationship with one another, then I, by my nature and you by your nature, will become increasingly selfish. And when this happens, I start to see a world whose only benefit to me is in what I can get out of it. I don't care about waste or pollution because I have no sense of the world anymore as a complex interdependent ecosystem, a perfect unspoiled creation that God has committed to my stewardship and your stewardship. Instead, I only see as far as the array of produce I get from my local supermarket. And once my waste and the byproducts of my own appetites and consumption is off my land, it becomes someone else's to deal with. I become desensitized, blind to human suffering other than my own, of course, and uninterested in the problems that others are facing. To all intents and purposes, I am oblivious to what else is happening in the world, or even, for that matter, right under my own nose. And I start to become a 
kind of mini king in my own little cardboard kingdom of my own creation, believing that I've made all this and feeling privileged and all-powerful and arrogant. Surely, I think, surely others could have all the good things I have. If only perhaps they, they worked a little harder, if only they stopped sponging off the benefit system, if only they were as clever as I have been. And bit by bit, I start to judge and I start to separate who I think are the sheep from the goats. And I choose more and more to mix only with those other people who are already like me, people who can convey on me advantage, those in my social class, in my gang, in my hood. And because of this, those people who are the only people I will go out of my way to help in the world are not anymore the vulnerable and the marginalised. Well, not unless someone I deem important or influential is watching me do it and I can get something from it. Because the vulnerable and the marginalised no longer have anything I want. What will inevitably happen is that increasingly I will serve only the people who are just like me. Just like me, but perhaps a few years ahead and a few rungs higher up the ladder. The people who can boost my career, give me a leg up in the world, give me a promotion or a pay rise. And I start to want power and I start to want wealth and I want influence and I want popular acclaim and I want sexual advantage and they are the earthly and fleshly gods that I will eventually come to worship. The golden calves of an increasingly sinful me who has turned away from God and in time forgotten him altogether in a secular and avarice-driven society. And so, bit by bit, I turn to wanting to pile up earthly treasures in storehouses instead of sharing them for the benefit of all. And pretty soon everyone else in all the world becomes someone or something to be exploited by my own appetites. Separation. Separation, I believe, is the cause of the trouble and the enemy to be defeated in the name of God. Because when we are separated from the vine, we are separated from the root and all the sweetness and goodness that flows through the trunk. And once we are cut off from that, there is nothing for us or for our poor hearts to do but shrivel up and harden to stone. And that is why Isaiah records the anger of the Lord burns against his people and his hand is raised against them to strike them down. And Isaiah goes on to list all the many calamities that are coming our way because of this attitude that we have. Many of them, it might be said, that we are living with now, the calamities of the present. And it's not until we turn the page on Isaiah chapter 5 and go on to read the beginning of chapter 6 that we find out that God has not in fact given up on us. It's not even close that God has come to giving up because God has a plan, a plan to overcome separation and to overcome it with love, a plan to send someone to face the angry tenants who have taken over the vineyard and to find and empower the apostles, the apostles that represent that only small bathtub of sweet grapes that produce wine in the whole 10 acres of bitter vines. And so in Isaiah 6, we get a tiny glimpse into God's throne room and we hear the famous challenge issued whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am. Here I am, Lord, send me. And I wonder what you will say as well. So God indeed does send his prophets like Isaiah. And eventually God sends his only son, Christ Jesus. And after that, as we learn at Pentecost in a few weeks time. God sends the Holy Spirit and through God and the Holy Spirit, Jesus sends each one of us. For as our reading from the first letter of John tells us today, if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. And by this, we know that 
we remain in him and he in us and he has given us his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. You see separation from one another and particularly separation, rebellion and rejection of God must inevitably produce bitter fruit. Fruit disconnected from the vine of love, fruit no longer abundant in natural goodness, wholeness or nutrition, fruit that can no longer satisfy our hunger, quench our appetites or slake our thirst. And the only cure, the only cure for us when we are like that, the only cure for our world is to get back into relationship with God. And the only way to do that is through the saving grace of Christ, who comes to us specifically now in the Easter season and indeed is right here throughout the year for that precise purpose to be our saviour. We were created by God to be forever and by forever I do mean forever in sweet mystic communion with God and through God as branches of the same vine with the same trunk and the same root in sweet mystic communion with one another. We were born an essential and much loved part of the vine and the goodness of God has flowed through us from creation and no matter who we are or what we have done that same living water can flow through us again. But we can only reach our true potential when we overcome our stubbornness, bow our heads and willingly enter the narrow gate that leads to that state of grace and heavenly kingdom that God freely offers. The choice is ours, but as Jesus explains to us, in reality, the vine dresser only has two options. And while the benefit of either may at first seem marginal, the effect indistinguishable in outcome and often equally or even more painful or difficult, it's nevertheless literally the whole difference between life and death, between cutting off the whole branch of bitter fruit so that the vine may spend its precious life force more productively somewhere else, or allowing God through the Holy Spirit in our lives to more expertly prune and clip and chop the branch back just a little bit less than lopping the whole thing off so that the fruit of next year's crop springs out fuller and sweeter and even more abundantly than ever. And as John tells us, we have nothing at all to fear if he abides in us and we in him.
God abiding in us, abiding in God. The Temple Jesus and his disciples entered and taught in the temple in Jerusalem and, once, famously, Jesus even drove the money changers out. But Jesus said of that temple, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Because he spoke about the temple of his body, and our bodies likewise are to be temples. For Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. But if we are each individually temples of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside us, then together we collectively become just building blocks in a far bigger temple of God. For as Peter writes, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Or, as Paul writes in Ephesians, In Christ, the whole building is fitted together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in Christ, we are also being built together into a dwelling place for God in his spirit. We come now to our prayers of intercession. I'm going to read to you a prayer, but after this, there will be a time of quiet when you can bring your own prayers to God. Prayers perhaps about friends, family, or the world in general. And then we will finish with the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. To all those in need of love, let the love of God be known. To a world in need of love, let the love of God be shown. For those in need of food, let the love of God be shared. By those in need of healing, let the love of God be experienced. By those in need of peace, let the love of God be felt. By those in need of hope, let the love of God be seen. To those in need of joy, let the love of God be sung. By those in need of justice, let the love of God be heard. By all those in need of love, 
let the love of God be known. A time of quiet. The Lord's Prayer Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I am the Vine by Malcolm Guide This is a sonnet by Malcolm Guide. It's an invitation to experience the bodily feel of being in Christ. So please let his words and the images on the screen help you to answer the question that he poses. How might it feel to be part of the vine? Not just to see the vineyard from afar, or even pluck the clusters, press the wine but to be grafted in, to feel the stir of inward sap that rises from our root, himself, deep planted in the ground of love. To feel a leaf unfold a tender shoot as tendrils curled unfurl, as branches give a little to the swelling of the grape in gradual perfection, round and full, to bear within oneself the joy and hope of God's good vintage, till it's ripe and whole. What might it mean to abide and to abide in such rich love as makes the poor heart glad? Keep us 
abiding in you then we'll grow in your love and we'll go in your name that the world will surely know that you have power to heal and to save You are the vine We are the branches keep us abiding in you you are the vine we are the branches keep us abiding God abiding in us, abiding in God. Love. Jesus once described that the greatest of all God's commandments was the commandment to love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. But it is not just our duty to love and pour out love for God and love for one another. We also become conjoined to love and one with love. For Paul in Ephesians states that Christ may strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts and we may then be rooted and grounded in love and will have power together with all the saints to comprehend the length and width and height and depth of the love of Christ and to know within ourselves this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. For as the first letter of John states, if anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God, and we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. Well, thank you to all our contributors this morning from a range of different churches within our circuit, each in sweet mystic communion with one another, and to Tim and to Leslie for coordinating them all. What better example could there be of the contribution we each make to one another when we are in Christ and Christ in us? And we hope you've enjoyed the little interludes as well, where we've attempted in different ways to describe to you how we can abide in God and God abide within us. And so our blessing. May your fruit be sweet and ripe and abundant. May the seeds you sow see fulfillment in all those of the faithful who follow after. May your relationships be long and joyful and fulfilling, and may you flow with kindness, patience, gentleness and goodness, teaching others to love through your service of love and your love of service. May you abide in the holiness of the Lord, 
and smile up at his face turned towards you. And may his peace, which passes all understanding, always remain with you and guard your heart and mind and soul. May Father, Son and Holy Spirit dwell in you always so that all the riches of heaven and life eternal be yours now and forever. In Christ's name and for Christ's glory. Amen. Now may the peace of the Lord be with you, be with you. Now may the peace of the Lord be with you, be with you. Now and May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, and may God's face shine upon you always, and give you peace. Face shine upon.